Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening, and thank you for supporting the Jefferson Hour. And I will just say that those of you who decide that you would like to support the Jefferson Hour can do so easily by going to jeffersonhour.com. Click on Donate. There's a number of ways to do it. We so appreciate it. Neither Clay nor I take any money for this show. All that money goes to the costs of producing and posting and putting on public radio. You can also find uh, a lot of information at the website about Clay's upcoming cultural tours. Well, I know you have a couple coming up soon. Your online courses. It's a deep website. There's a lot there. We're very proud of it. This week, we speak with President Jefferson about the cost of war. This is, I think, one of our more important programs, David. I think that Jefferson is exactly the person we need to to consult at a moment like this. Not that we necessarily agree with his line of thinking, but he asks the questions that a nation should ask itself when it's involved, as we in some peripheral way are, with what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. Jefferson was an isolationist. It's probably too late for that. But his isolationist sort of default view that, on the whole, we should stay out of these things is really important for us to think about, as well as his view is, who's going to pay for all this? We're now over $50 billion in to this war, and probably it will come closer to $100 billion before we um, cease to send checks uh, to Ukraine. So Jefferson, I think, is not necessarily right, but he's right on, if that makes any sense. And remember, we did war uh, discussions before we invaded Iraq. You will recall that. We didn't say we told you so. We just said we need to remind people that these things tend to go wrong. The fog of war, that that, that that on day one, the war takes a turn that you could never have anticipated. And so here we are again. And I think on these grave international moments, David, we can provide at least some historical clarity by offering up the most principled advocate of peace in our history. Well, without giving out too much about this week's conversation, and in the spirit of keeping this podcast intro short to make up for last week's 10-minute epic. Was it 10 minutes? <laughs> uh, uh, I will say, that we, you know, we begin talking about the American Revolution and France's support for us and how that affected the outcome of the American Revolution. In the end, Jefferson talked about war is never really changing anything. And I should have come back at him and said, yeah, but in the case of the American Revolution, it really did. This is a kind of a paradox, one of the many in Jefferson, that he hated war and really was a pacifist in basically, you know, we have to remember that he fought the war against the Tripolitan pirates during his first term, but he was essentially a pacifist. And an idealistic one. He, he truly did believe that war is just a species of madness and that humans should m- graduate from war into something like you know, the, the United Nations or whatever. Um, you know, we see how naive that view probably is, but he believed all of this. And so, and yet he thought that the revolution was a just war. Well, the distinction he's trying to make, David, is that that was a war of, of liberation. We weren't fighting over borders or tariffs on wine and furniture or the the mistresses of kings. We were fighting for our national self-determination, and that's a just war. And and unfortunately, it, it has to involve blood, but that's a just use of blood. Whereas a war between Ukraine and Russia about who controls ports is exactly what war shouldn't be what that's the madness of war for Jefferson. So we don't necessarily have to accept that distinction, but that's the distinction he was trying to create. All right, sir. With that, we should go to the show. I I do want to mention that we've gotten some really nice feedback about the two shows you and Lindsay Travinsky did about Theodore Roosevelt. And, you know, we really failed to mention that there's this uh, documentary coming out, if it isn't out already, that you participated in. It will be out by the time this airs, but I hope people will look for it. It's on the History Channel. It's by Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's a docudrama. There's some reenactment. I'm not part of that. I'm a talking head. I've heard myself on some of the ads. 
I got a call the other day from one of the producers saying you should watch this because you are a big, big, big thing in this thing. So we'll see, you know, I'm always pretty <laughs> skeptical. And of course I'll be looking at it. Like I said that really, Oh my, why could I take it back? Can you erase the tape? But uh, apparently it's going to be a big deal and I was thrilled to do it. So that's Roosevelt. Who's one of my favorite historical figures, but you know, I love Roosevelt, but my basic outlook on life is Jeffersonian and for all of his terrible faults, I want to live in Thomas Jefferson's America much more than in Theodore Roosevelt's America. Certainly not in my America. Ditto. So my friend, let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm your host, David Swenson, here with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, the man who portrays Mr. Jefferson when he's here. And now, seated before me is Thomas Jefferson. I say good day to you, sir. Good day to you, my dear citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I wanted to speak with you this week about the cost of war, specifically starting with the American Revolution. My understanding, sir, is that at the beginning of the revolution, the colonies were flourishing economically. They enjoyed free trade. American merchants were able to transport their goods in European and American ships. Taxes were reasonable or non-existent. But as the war began and continued, America's era of economic prosperity began to fail. Well, there certainly was a setback, not only because we had to divert the useful purposes of an economy to arms, uh, cannons, uh, gunpowder, uh, clothing for troops, rifles, and so on. And that meant that the, there was no money for more important things like libraries and schools and the improvements in agriculture or internal uh, improvements like canals and roads and bridges and post offices. So there was that cost of war. But a war is also destructive. The British had uh, destroyed Norfolk. Uh, they occupied our cities. They damaged our property. They burned our crops. When the war came to Virginia, during my time as governor of Virginia, they marched on Monticello but did not damage it much. But at my other farms, they burned tobacco barns down, um, stole or killed horses, ran off with enslaved people. Uh, the havoc of the war, all the way from New Hampshire down to Georgia, was enormous. And once you destroy all of that, of course, it has to be rebuilt. And when you're rebuilding, you're using money and, and human ingenuity that could better be spent in some other way. So unfortunately, this was what we call a just war. We, we knew that we, we must declare our independence from Britain. That was a moral responsibility. We knew that this was going to cost blood and treasure, and it did. The war lasted much longer than anyone could have hoped. Uh, by the time the war was over, we had a huge state debt. Every state had gone into debt to survive and a huge national debt. Mr. Hamilton combined them uh, when he was the Secretary of the Treasury, and suddenly we're a free nation, but we're a free nation weighed down with this enormous debt burden. Uh, and where did that debt burden come from? It came from survival, and it came from our insistence upon being treated as a sovereign and independent nation. So we began with this deficit, a deficit of buildings, a deficit of horses, a deficit of uh, farmlands and food, a deficit of funds. And fortunately, the new world is so fertile and the American people are so industrious that we were soon able to, to crawl out from all of that debt. But imagine what we could have done with those years and those, those funds, including human resources, had we not had to, to fight a bloody war of independence, had this really just occurred diplomatically, sir. Well, we're talking about the economic cost of war, and of course the human toll is a whole nother subject, but uh, the United States had to deal with this economically. My understanding is they began to print money in order to deal with the debts. Yes, so we needed to finance the war. Robert Morris of Philadelphia was the American financier of the war. We had no national bank. We really had almost no banks at the time. 
We were still a very primitive, almost in-kind economy. And so Robert Morris, who was a friend to the establishment people like George Washington and Governor Morris and so on, uh, was able to put together, to patch together a financial system, which, which allowed us to go on. But we couldn't get the loans that we needed. We got some money from France, but not nearly enough. And so at that point, you begin to write uh, IOUs or you issue currency or paper currency. These in our time were known as continentals. This was the first national currency of the United States. And as you well know, by the time the war ended, these continentals had lost most of their value. And we were now facing a, a world of inflation because if, if, a, if a continental can buy a hogshead of tobacco one day and the next day it can only buy a quarter of a hogshead of tobacco, then you print more money to make that possible. Congress just printed more money, as we've talked about, to fund these expenses. But the result was severe inflation and the depreciation of the continental dollar, as you've just said. Of course. And this you know, produced a, a set of crises. I paid much of my own personal debt during the course and shortly after the war. But under the terms of the Paris Agreement of 1783, those payments were not accepted because they had been made with continental currency. And so not only had I sacrificed to pay my bills during the war to keep up with interest payments and so on, but after the war, I had to pay them all over again with our new national currency. And so this is one example of thousands, maybe tens of thousands up and down the American coastal heartland during this time. So everybody suffered. Widows whose husbands had been killed in the war, who lived in towns and cities, suffered. Farmers suffered. The British carried away more than 30 of my slaves. And although I'm a, an opponent of slavery, this was still a, a, an enormous economic loss. We had to scramble after the war to put together something like an economy. And, and we knew that this was a, a just war, a righteous war, a war that, that had to be fought. But nobody can say that it wasn't a devastating blow to the pursuit of happiness of the people of the United States. In the long run, we knew everything would be fine. In the short run, uh, it produced some very severe disruptions. America is currently suffering a period of inflation, Mr. President, but nothing like what occurred during the American Revolution. Uh, I have read that the average annual inflation rate was about 4.3%, but it actually reached a high of almost 30% in 1778, leading to food riots and destruction of private property. But Congress continued issuing this printed money, the continental dollar. One of the problems that we should bring to this discussion was the failure of the Articles of Confederation. So we were 13 individual colonies until July 4th, 1776. And each of those colonies had a colonial relationship with the British Parliament or some entity back in Great Britain. Once we declared independence, we were now a new nation and it wasn't clear at the moment what those 13 new states, those 13 new countries, Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, North Carolina, should do. We came together to to survive to fight the war and it took a couple of years into that war for us to create the first constitution of the united states the articles of confederation and we had been operating in a kind of ad hoc way up until then suddenly we have articles of confederation but the articles were so weak that they did not allow the national government such as it was to tax individual states and it certainly didn't allow the government to tax individual human beings so the government was desperately in need of money. It requisitioned taxes from the state. So it would actually send a letter to Virginia saying, given your population and your economy and your land base, we are asking you, Virginia, to contribute $5 million to the federal treasury. Uh, we hope that you will comply. And they would send another letter to North Carolina saying, given your population and so on, we ask you to send $3 million. But there was no enforcement arm. The states often simply ignored these requests, not because they didn't believe in the nation, 
but because they were so desperate to pay for the things they had to pay within their own state boundaries. And so the national government was this helpless giant that couldn't tax. It had no resources. It had to request resources from the states. And this was a disaster. And by the way, that's the main reason why the new constitution of 1787 was written. The people who went to Philadelphia, and I was not one of them, were drawn there to at least to remedy that problem, to give the, the, the national government the, the federal authority to tax and the authority to enforce the taxes. In other words, if Virginia didn't want to pay those taxes, the national government would have the power to compel Virginia to meet its taxation needs. So this is really why you got the Constitution of the United States that you still enjoy with 27 amendments in your own time. That's very interesting, Mr. Jefferson. So what you're saying is that the memory of the struggles, particularly economically during the Revolutionary War, led to some of the attitude of how our present Constitution was written. Is that correct? You're absolutely right. So, you know, George Washington and, and Henry Knox and Alexander Hamilton and the others who were really the, the ones who waged the war were terribly frustrated. They couldn't get the states to send wagons or horses or hay or oats or cloth. And the states were not lackluster. They weren't, they weren't deliberately trying to annoy the national government. They simply didn't have the resources. And so Washington essentially said, this is no way to run a revolutionary army. And the troops would desert. People would sign up for very short amounts of time. He couldn't, he couldn't hold an army together that as you all know from American legend, and it's true, the, the, the troops sometimes didn't have shoes at Valley Forge. They, they were wrapping their feet in rags and walking through the snow and leaving a trail of blood as they walked. Uh, medical supplies were inadequate. Food supplies were inadequate. And so the, Washington became more and more frustrated. He understood the problem, but he became frustrated because he said, you can't be a nation if you don't have the capacity to compel taxation that will enable that nation to do the very basic things that a nation does. We got through it. We outlasted the British. They finally gave up. The French helped in a huge way, not only by loans, uh, but by sending people like Lafayette and the and the, the troops, the, the ships that, that boxed the British in at, at Yorktown. And so Washington and others believe that having barely survived this crisis, we needed to create a, a stronger federal authority, and that eventually came in 1787. Mr. Jefferson, we need to take a short break from this conversation. I'm glad you brought up France, because I would like to talk about that in our, in our next part of the conversation, sir. Indeed. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week we're speaking with President Jefferson about the cost of war. And when we took our break, sir, you brought up the fact that France helped the United States economically. In fact, it was in 1778, I believe, a treaty of alliance between the French and the Continental Army was enacted. And this meant that the French provided money, war material, and troops to the United States. This really was a determining factor in America's eventual victory, was it not? Of course. This was the work of Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Franklin spent a, about a third of his life in England and on the continent of Europe. We sent him to France to secure loans if possible. It was a very difficult thing because the French government was already impoverished and the French absolutist king, uh, Louis XVI, was not particularly in favor of Republican democratic social and political movements in the new world but in the french and indian war that ended in 1763 the french lost their new world holdings they lost canada effectively they were defeated in a humiliating way by the british in europe it's called the seven years war here the french and indian war when our revolution began in 1776 the french weren't interested in helping us so much as they were in hurting their ancient enemy, Britain. And so, in a sense, they were fighting the war against Britain through proxy. 
by giving us this very large loan. That loan was really secured by the great Benjamin Franklin, and he, he signed uh, on our behalf a treaty of uh, perpetual amity with the French. That money did not win the war, but the war probably could not have been won without that loan. And then these young, brilliant people like Lafayette came over as freedom fighters who wanted to be part of this great movement in world history towards human liberty and the rights of man. And they helped us. And then at Yorktown, it was the French fleet that arrived pretty late, uh, but boxed in Cornwallis and made it impossible for him to break out. He was surrounded on the land side by Washington's army, which included, by the way, brilliant young Colonel Hamilton. And then at sea, the British were blocked in by the French fleet. And we would have won the war, I think, no matter what, because an island can't control a continent forever. But the Battle of Yorktown, not the last battle of the revolution, was certainly the one that made it clear to the British that the cost for them was simply going to be too high. It was going to be infinite for them to try to hold on to their American colonies. The, the British people were, were tired of it. They were tired of the taxation. They were tired of the loss of, of, of the, their troops. Uh, or even for those troops that survived their long period of, of, of being abroad in the New World. And so the British were growing restive at the same time that the British um, Treasury was being you know, drained, um, bled to death by this protracted war. So economics play a very important part in all of this. The British could have continued indefinitely. They were the greatest uh, army and navy in the world at the time. But that money has to come from somewhere. And the British people were didn't think that they had a particular stake in what's going on in Georgia or South Carolina. And so eventually the British gave up, but they did so in large part because of, of French assistance. So let me say one more word about that as long as we're on this subject. A dozen or so years later, the United States repudiated provisions of that treaty with France. When France needed us during their wars of the revolution, the so-called Napoleonic Wars, but this really before Napoleon came to power, Hamilton and, and George Washington, I'm sorry to say, um, proclaimed neutrality. So France had helped us when we needed them. They weren't neutral between 1776 and 1783. They gave to us in ways that from a geopolitical standpoint, we may not have deserved. And now when they were desperately in need of our support, and not just morally, but from the treaty we had signed with them, the Washington administration decided we would be neutral in the wars of the continent. And it seemed to me that this was a failure of our gratitude towards the French nation and the French people who had played so material a role in our securing our liberty. What I hear you saying, Mr. Jefferson, is in the end, America owes a debt of gratitude to France, doesn't it? Enormous debt. Our natural ally should be France. Most of the Americans of my time, in some sense or other, had come from, the, from Great Britain. Uh, there was a natural sort of cultural affinity between us. But our real allegiance should be to France. Remember that when the French Revolution occurred, the, the monarchies of the old world, Britain and Austria and others, formed an alliance to crush the French Revolution because they didn't want to see those same ideas of human liberty infiltrating their own despotic or authoritarian states. And so they banded together to snuff out this terribly liberating idea that humans were born with rights. And we, so far from helping France, which was the next logical step after our revolution, proclaim neutrality as if it were none of our business. Well, if France had said that to us in 1776, it's hard to know how our war of revolution would have come out. And so I was in the Washington administration. I was the secretary of state. I, I, I made the case for our, our moral obligations to France. I couldn't win that argument. And that hastened my 
desire to retire from the Washington administration, which I did in December of 1793. You know, they were behaving with what's known as realpolitik, you know, like deep pragmatism, self-interest for America, which all nations do, by the way, and probably all nations should. But I had a sentimental devotion to what France had done for us during the war, and I hearkened back to that treaty, and I urged the Washington administration to tilt slightly towards France, uh, but it didn't. And this makes perfect sense in the world of hard-headed geopolitics. It makes very little sense if you really believe in the, uh, the, the ideals of humanity. You famously wrote, peace, commerce, an honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Now, to use, you must be aware, Mr. Jefferson, there's a major conflict, a world conflict going on between two nations right now, Russia and Ukraine. And our current president defined this war as part of a world struggle of democracy over authoritarianism. I understand your stance of entangling alliances with none, but... Don't we owe our support to the fight for liberty and freedom? I understand what you're saying, sir. And late in my life, I said, at some point, all nations will be republics, some sooner, some later, eventually all. But I said, before that, rivers and oceans of blood will flow. These spasms for liberty do not come at no cost, that this is going to take an enormous amount of struggle, buildings bombed, innocents killed, populations starved, economies broken, armies marching across borders. And the people who die in every army, whether it's the U.S. Army or the French Army or the British Army, th these are on the whole young men with their lives in front of them. They almost never really understand the point of the struggle. They're patriots. They're doing their national service. They want to get married. They want to have children. They want to pursue happiness. They want strolls in the evening. They want to plant petunias in their gardens. They're human beings like the rest of us. And then we um, select a portion of them, often by conscription, sometimes by violent conscription, and send them off to some place halfway around the world to shoot at other human beings who never offended them. You know, wars are created by old men and fought by young men. I believed as a figure of the Enlightenment that it was too late in the world's history to solve our struggles through bloodshed and that our passion should be peace and diplomacy should prevail wherever possible. And that for the United States, at least, you know, the world's only real republic at the time, that war should be the last, and I mean the very last melancholy answer when all other diplomatic methods had failed and and we should attempt again and again and again to find the avenue of peace and only with the deepest sense of reluctance even sense of tragedy eventually enter into a war i hope that that would become in a sense the mission statement of the united states and and i said i you know i'm i'm one of the creators of of the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe was, as you know, one of my protégés. I wrote to him in 1823 when I was a very old man because he had asked me what our policy should be to wars in Central and South America, sometimes colonial wars, and what our attitude should be to affairs in Europe. And, and I said, our first and fundamental maxim should be never to entangle ourselves in the broils of Europe. And our second should be never to let them entangle themselves into the affairs of the Western Hemisphere. So yes, I believe in the cause of liberty. I hope that the people you speak of will be able to achieve self-determination and to, and to hold on to it. Whether this is a war that the United States should be involved in in a material way is for me a matter of great concern. I believe that the greatest thing the United States can do is to build a society that is so just so devoted to the rights of man so beautiful with its libraries and its dance and its music and its painting and its sculpture and its beautiful farms and gardens and its 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 commitment to 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 the to the human project and to the pursuit of happiness that we would build a model nation 
and other nations would want to be like us because they would see what happiness can bring to humans when they are left alone to pursue happiness without undue government intrusion and without the madness of war, and that this would be a better export of the great ideals of America than guns and bullets and soldiers. And so I would like to export the idea of America with a capital I. I'm, I'm in a sense, working from Pericles' funeral oration in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, that the greatest export for Athens, the greatest defense of Athens would be to build the most extraordinary polis in the world and let the world see it and ache to be like that. Mr. Jefferson, you know the phrase, the fog of war. You know, once hostilities begin, it's 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 difficult to even know exactly what's going on. I think of your time and the the distance and how long it, it took to get messages. And as an American citizen, I, I naturally uh, want to support the underdog, want to support those struggling for liberty. But it's difficult to even understand the facts of this conflict at times. Agreed, sir. So if I may simply use terms from your time for a moment, I understand that this is a war between Russia and Ukraine, is it not? Yes, sir. So I would wonder how many Americans could find on a map of the world the outlines of Ukraine, uh, what they know about the people of that nation, its history, its prior relations with Russia, with the czars or czarinas or whatever other entities there were, what its um, ethnic makeup is, and, and how much kinship there is between the people of one country in this battle and another. So that's the first thing. And I'm guessing that most Americans know very little about such things as they did about similar things in my own time. And I also know that in these situations, there is almost never a black and white paradigm that all evil is not represented by one nation and all virtue by the other, that in almost every situation that I was involved in in my life, there are gray areas. There are complexities, there are nuances, there are, there are perplexities, and that we, living in the United States, thousands of miles from these quarrels, cannot possibly know enough to take sides in some sort of realistic way. And if we assume one, one nation is the nation of liberty and the other is the nation of oppression, that may in the grossest sense be true. But I think that in almost all situations, the actual dynamics of it are almost infinitely more complex than you can know from a newspaper clip in Philadelphia or Boston or Charleston. And so I would urge the American people to look inward, not outward, and to focus on your crises, challenges, opportunities, unresolved portions of the national enterprise, and not to presume that you know enough to interfere or even take sides in, in the quarrels of Europe. I've thought of the Atlantic Ocean as a 3,000-mile moat between us and the havoc of the old world. And, and, I, and truly, I, I would have had a hard time seeing any American legitimate interest in a place that most people have barely heard of five or 6,000 miles away. Well, finally, Mr. Jefferson, by my own research, and it's hard to determine this because it's happening so fast, it would appear that the United States has provided about $53 billion in aid to Ukraine. The Senate Minority Leader said, the future of American security and core strategic interests will be shaped by the outcome of this fight. Now, if that's true, isn't America justified in providing this aid, as France did to us? It must survive. That self-preservation is the, the central purpose of a government. And whatever it takes to do that, a government must do. If we're invaded by the Canadians, we must repel them. If American security is indeed and measurably at risk, of course we must participate because our, we would be morally reprehensible if we allowed something to happen that in the end undermined the capacity of the American experiment to continue along its traditional lines, of course. But establishing that connection is very difficult. And, and I would ask further, uh, 
if you have spent that seemingly infinite amount of money to help one of the two nations at risk here, where does that money come from? You know, we began by talking about inflation and the depreciation of currency. Do you have surpluses in your treasury to that amount? Where do, are you taxing the American people um, by a special one-time tax for this war so that you can avoid the ruin of a national debt? Or are you simply printing money to enable this to happen? It seems like a very large sum, and I would hope that that your government was, was planning to retire whatever that amount is within a handful of years, and maybe to, to offer a special tax to the American people for this purpose. Then let me say one last thing about this. Almost every war ends with the restoration of the status quo antebellum, with the restoration of the very conditions before the war. The War of 1812, our second war of national independence, is a perfect example. We fought this war with Britain. It was ruinous. They actually burned the capital of the United States. In the end, it was a, it was a kind of a draw. Nothing changed. No boundary changed. Each side re retired to its corner. But millions of dollars and pounds sterling had been lost. People died, blood was shed, towns and, and communities were ruined. Uh, it diverted our national enterprise from the arts of peace to the arts of war. And in the end, the, the treaty restored precisely the conditions anti-bellum before the war. And this is not unusual. This is almost always the result. And I would guess, if you think about it, the, the result of the war you're talking about will will almost in, will almost certainly end in the restoration of the status quo antebellum, and at what cost, sir? Thank you so much, Mr. Jefferson, and I guess we could both agree that we wish this conflict would come to an end very soon. Peace is my passion. May there be peace throughout the world, and may the United States be the great exemplar of peace. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll be speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, the man who portrays President Jefferson, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. Sitting across from me is my dear friend, the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. David, this is a really important topic, and I want to read something to you and get your reaction to it. I'm listening, sir. Ask yourself who said this. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electrical power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 in population, and so on. Who do you think said that? Boy, I, I can think of a number of candidates, and I'm not going to guess. You must tell me. Dwight David Eisenhower. I'm not surprised. The man who led the D-Day invasions of Normandy saying towards the end of his great career that every dollar you spend on war is a dollar that is taken away from the work of peace, the work of education, the work of civilization, the work of feeding your own people and, and the hungry people of the world. I got a copy of my favorite uh, magazine in the mail yesterday, David, the, the British economist, and the, the cover story is about the coming famine. The, the famine that is going to uh, certainly affect Africa, and there will be hunger in Russia, hunger in Ukraine, that the, the great grain facilities on the Black Sea are tied up because the Russians have disrupted the, the port and, and occupied many of those port cities, that there is going to be a worldwide spike in the price of food. We have already are seeing it. And there is going to be some spotty famine and real actual hunger because of this war. So it's not just between Ukraine and Russia. It's a world event. It may not yet be a world war. And that this, this is exactly what Jefferson was talking about. So he regarded the revolution as a just war, 
he did not fight in it, but he regarded war war like Ukraine v. Russia or France v. Britain as pointless because it usually ends with the restoration of the status quo and it costs a gazillion dollars and it's a setback for the cause of civilization. And really, when you get down to it, what has been gained? So this is why Jefferson is important, David, is because we don't have to agree with him about this, but he makes us think about these questions in, I think, a very useful way. What, what's your take on all of this? I chuckled at the end of Jefferson's segment when he, he had to get one dig in on Canada, a nation which the whole world loves, um, but not Mr. Jefferson. No, he wanted Canada. But I also found his uh, comments about antebellum very interesting. You know, these, these wars occur, and in the end, nothing changes all that much. And, and I also really appreciate you quoting Eisenhower, the, the president who at the end of his presidency warned us straight up about the military-industrial complex. Yeah, we've got that complex uh, deep in our national DNA now. I'm giving this talk soon in Philadelphia, an endowed lecture, and I've, the, the topic that I chose, David, is Alexander von Humboldt, the explorer, the German explorer. Oh, yeah. Right. And Thomas Jefferson, and he vi- will do a program on this. He visited Jefferson in the White House on June 4th through 10th of 1804, just at the time Lewis and Clark were in the middle of Missouri on their way up towards uh, the source of the Missouri River. And, and, and he and Humboldt, Jefferson and Humboldt, did not know each other before that, but they formed a friendship. And in 1813, after, during the War of 1812, so 1813 was squat in the war, of 1812, Jefferson wrote a letter to Humboldt, and I just want to read you a passage from it, because I think it's so interesting. The European nations constitute a separate division of the globe. Their localities make them part of a distinct system. They have a set of interests of their own in which it is our business never to engage ourselves. America has a hemisphere to itself. It must have its separate system of interests which must not be subordinated to those of Europe, the insulated state in which nature has placed the American continent should so far avail that no spark of war kindled in other quarters of the globe should be wafted across the wide oceans which separate us from them. That's the classic statement of American isolationism. I think you made the point during the program. It's probably too late for isolationism in the 21st century. It's a very deeply entangled global system. And isolationism has actually bitten us a number of times in the 20th century, particularly. But but I want to say this, David, the status quo antebellum, because Vladimir Putin's invasion has stalled and maybe failed at the cost of unbelievable brutalization. 15 million Ukrainians have been made refugees by this, either internally or going west into Poland and Romania and so on. 15 million, that's a third of the population of Ukraine has been dislocated from their homes, homes they may never get to return to by this war so far. But now that Vladimir Putin appears to be stalled out, the geopolitical pundits are saying, well, maybe in the end he gets a, he gets to keep the Donbass and he gets to keep Crimea and maybe a little corridor along the Black Sea to connect Crimea with Russia. In other words, almost exactly the status quo antebellum, that in the end he gets to maybe consolidate a little bit what he got in more or less effortlessly in 2014. Can it be worth it? You know, the, what we're hearing is maybe 25,000 Russian troops have already died. A very large number of Ukrainians have died, both troops and civilians. That If you look at these cities, David, that, that, I mean, they're, they've turned into something that looks like Berlin in 1945 or Tokyo. You know, how does this end? You know, let's say that, that Putin wins in some sense of that term. He hasn't made any friends in Ukraine. You know, he's made bitter enemies of most of the people of Ukraine. He's damaged his position throughout the world. He's made Russia a pariah state. The economic sanctions are are biting. Finland and Sweden are probably going to be part of NATO, the very thing he wanted to avoid. 
uh, he reunited the European nations when they were really in a state of disintegration. It's been a disaster, but even in the best possible case now, it's largely going to be the status quo antebellum. And you think, how can any even slightly reasonable human being regard this as worth it? Let me ask you this, David. You know, I can't watch, and I, every night I turn on the news and watch a little of this and read the newspapers, the New York Times, and so on. And it's, it, I know this sounds like, like almost a cliche, but it's, it sickens me. And I'm guessing it yeah. sickens you. I'm just sick at heart. For, and not just for the Ukrainians, of course, mostly for them, but I'm sick at heart for the cause of humanity. Well, you know, I wanted to talk to Jefferson about this because of his famous, you know, entanglements with none statement. And um, my takeaway was that Jefferson was um, reluctantly saying, yes, you have to support the cause for liberty. And and I do think that the idea of, of France saving America is, is a worthwhile parallel to consider. I do too. You know, I'm going to sound like I'm just um, full of contradictions and maybe I am. I looked on and I know you did too, with the deepest chagrin when we fought an unnecessary war in Iraq. And I looked on with terrible chagrin when we prolonged what was at first maybe a necessary war with Afghanistan, but which turned into a terrible quagmire. And as we know, both of them ended not only with the restoration of the status quo antebellum, but arguably both of those nations were much worse when it was over than they were before we got involved. And I lamented those wars because I'm a Jeffersonian and I, I listened to him and I believe him when he says it should be the very, very, very last melancholy thing that a nation ever does. It should do so reluctantly. It should be apologetic to the world that it's doing so. It should, it should, it should handle those wars with the greatest possible discretion. It should target only serious targets and so on and so forth. And I believe those were have been proven by history already to be unnecessary wars. Well, now I think this might be a necessary war. I feel like maybe this is one we should be involved in. I I find myself, and I'll bet you do too, or maybe you do, maybe you don't. I find myself sort of wishing that NATO would take out one of those 40-mile convoys and say, we've got to step between Russia and this catastrophe. And I know that's a very dangerous provocation, but when we fight unnecessary wars, why do we cringe at fighting one I regard as a just war? Yeah, I, I pretty much am in agreement with you, but I, I have to say, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on um you know in this era of of propaganda we know we're getting propaganda from both sides i spoke to jefferson about the fog of war and he agreed um it, it, so it's difficult to know exactly what what is happening uh, you know right now things don't look real good for ukraine uh they're in, in uh, some difficult positions it's hard to know what's really going on david and I think that I would say to the listeners to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, distrust what you're hearing, not openly with cynicism and derision, but be skeptical about what you're hearing from both sides and including from reporters because they're being kept away from some of the scenes of this havoc. And the fog of war makes us have a kind of a impressionistic view of what's going on. And we tend to radically oversimplify it in, in every that's, case. That's, that's exactly right. I guess that's the point I was trying to make. And yet um, we have to acknowledge that there is an aggressor nation involved in this war that crossed borders with their own troops. And it's pretty hard to deny the, uh, the aggression, the, the bombing and the shelling of cities and the, the, as you say, 15 million refugees. and it, A, it makes me sick at heart. But B, I know that as someone who's keenly interested in this, I don't know nearly enough to really know enough. I do think that Russia is the aggressor nation and Ukraine is the more innocent of the two. No question in my mind. But I also know it's a lot more complicated. Well, let me let me ask you this then. In you know the the final few minutes that we have this week's conversation, what would Jefferson do? 
if he were living and president now, what would he do? Well, of course, we don't know. He died on 4th of July. Oh, yes, but that's your job. You're supposed to know or at least speculate. <laughs> I think that he would do less than we're doing. I think he would say, and I, and as I said in character, hey, where's the money coming from? You know, and, and so that's that's a huge business in and of itself. And B, we're in the war. So much of the material that's dropping on Russian tanks and Russian troops or Russian ships or taking down Russian airplanes, those weapons were ma many of which, the majority of which are now being manufactured in the United States of America by our military industrial complex. So we're in this war. It's a proxy war. If we weren't supplying the Ukrainians and the countries of Europe weren't supplying, supplying the Ukrainians, they would have lost the war long since. So we are in it. And I think Jefferson would say, let's ask a whole range of very rigorous and very serious questions about this, of ourself, our purposes, the financing of this thing, uh, why we're in this, what we hope to accomplish. So we don't live in Jefferson's world, David. He was an isolationist and the Atlantic was a much wider ocean then than it is now. Today, we have something called the liberal world order that emerged after World War II. And that meant that there would be no more boundary changes. Well, uh, we saw the Cold War end. And now this battle is the first time since World War II that an aggressive army has tried to enlarge itself at the cost of another nation's sovereign territory. We had decided we would never let that happen. And NATO's Charter 5, it, it's, it's Article 5 in the NATO Charter, says that if any NATO country is attacked, then all of NATO has to respond. Well, Ukraine doesn't happen to be in NATO. And so we're all saying, well, it doesn't really count because they're not part of the club. I mean, that's just such a lame argument. If they were part of the club, we would protect them. But if they're not part of the club, I guess we wring our hands. And that's why Sweden and Finland are trying to get in the club, because that means if, if Putin attacked them, Article 5 of the Atlantic Charter would, would force us, would require us to enter. And remember that Donald Trump tried to, to get us out of Article 5. He said Article 5 was not good because it would compel us to fight in such a war. I find that argument casuistic and really weak that, oh, too bad Ukraine isn't part of the of NATO, in which case we'd be there helping them. It, the liberal world order is a great, great thing. The failure of it is could be the beginning of chaos in Europe and Asia, and maybe even in the Western Hemisphere. I believe in the liberal world order. And by the way, liberal doesn't mean like Nancy Pelosi, it means something else. To let this happen opens the door to the possibility of a whole new world of, of really ugly, aggressive, violent disputes. And I, I fear for the future. I believe that Jefferson would say, be very cautious. But I think it made Jefferson's validity is in asking questions, but not providing the answers in this case. Well, sir, we're coming to a close. I, you know, I guess the most optimistic thing I, I can think of is, is the response of many citizens who have um, looked at this situation and say, it's 2022 and this is happening in our world. And I, I, that's, that's my attitude as well. And with that, uh, we want to thank you all for listening to the Jefferson Hour Go to jeffersonhour.com for more information uh, to find out about Clay's um, upcoming tours, cultural tours, and online courses. And anything final from you, sir? Yeah, one quick thing. We have not mentioned the name Zelensky. He's young. He was a comic. He's immensely popular. He has stepped up in just an extraordinary way and inspired the world. The fact that the world is so much on Ukraine's side is in some large part because of the genius of Zelensky. We live in a gerontocracy. You know, it, it, the election of 2024 could be between an 80-year-old person and a 79-year-old person or something very close to that. Uh, we need, maybe we need some comics. Maybe John Stewart for president or, <laughs> you know, one of the late night talk shows for president. Uh, uh, the, the fact that 
the fact that we're having this conversation owes in some large part to the, the political leadership and genius of Zelensky. And I say all hail to him. Thanks, everyone. You've been listening to a special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll see you all next week for another important issue of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.